This is my second day in a row being here at Mansion House, ladies and gentlemen, because yesterday the Lord Mayor honored me by granting me the privilege of being a free man of the city of London. And um, I'm privileged to have that now. I didn't realize that for all these years I was driving my sheep across the Thames illegally, but now I can do this. I can also walk in London with a drawn sword uh, and get shot very quickly, probably. But uh, thank you, sir. It's a privilege to be here. Um, Mark, thank you. Uh, Mark has sort of stepped out, but I really want to thank him uh, so much for his leadership. The GFANS is extraordinarily important. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I am very grateful to, and, and, and you can't understate the importance of having the former governor of the Bank of England, somebody who understands finance, understands profitability and business plans, um, who is championing this conversion, this transition, as we've called it. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes, uh, if I may. Um, a little hard to believe we're six months beyond uh, COP26, Glasgow six months away from COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh. And it was about a year ago on the eve of the summit that uh, Secretary Yellen and President Biden, uh, of the leaders summit that President Biden held, that Secretary Yellen and I joined up with this organization uh, to help launch it. Um, and I promise you that on the road to Glasgow, which was a success way beyond what, what the media, frankly, actually characterized it as. Um, and I'll say a word about that in a minute. Um, but it sent a really critical signal uh, about ambition, which is what we set out to raise as we went to Glasgow. So I thank you for signing up. I thank you for being in the vanguard. I thank you for being pioneers and being willing to take some of the risks that come with leadership. Uh, all of what you did literally helped us to do more than people know we did in Glasgow. We embraced the 1.5 degree level. I was in Paris, led our negotiations there, and I can tell you 1.5 was sort of an afterthought to try to deal with the island states and vulnerable countries that felt they hadn't been listened to sufficiently. And so uh, at the last minute, we went from the commitment to hold the Earth's temperature increase from two degrees, or well below two degrees, to 1.5. And that was now embraced, even by the largest emitting nations and some of the developing nations in the world. 1.5. Why? Because as one of the panelists said earlier, it's the science that guides us. And the science was telling us in the 2018 IPCC report that two no longer cut it. That if we're going to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis, we have to achieve or try to get as close as we can to a limit of 1.5 degrees of temperature increase. So that required all of our countries to begin to put together an NDC, the National Determined Contribution of Reductions, to a level that would hold on to the 1.5 degrees. And uh, it's critical to understand that because uh, if we don't hold the 1.5 degrees, each tenth of a degree brings with it uh, you know, quantitative uh, aggregation in the damage that will be done. And we can qualify that today. We have that ability. The document that we came up with in Glasgow um, committed 65% <clears throat> of global GDP to real plans that have been independently accredited to be real to hold the Earth's temperature at that 1.5 degrees. And that is obviously mostly the developed world. You have to think about this. I believe the best framework to think about this is this context. 20 countries equal 80% of all emissions. 20 countries. And 65% of that global GDP effort is now committed to 1.5 degrees. So that means obviously 35% is not. And we have to figure out how we're going to bring those folks to the table, which is our principal 
action or activity that we're engaged in right now in diplomacy around the world. And it's complicated. Russia is among those uh, in that group. So the document, I just want to say a word more about Glasgow so you understand fully, and I'm not suggesting you don't, but I want to emphasize it here today, uh, the degree to which um, Glasgow has set a standard and been realistic about what we have to try to achieve. So for the first time ever, the document embraced the need to transition from fossil fuel, the need to phase down fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. And even China, India, signed on saying that we should phase down. As you know, there was a fight in the last minutes about whether it was phase down or phase out. And it was settled on phase down, but you have to phase down in order to phase out. And if over the next four years that's the distance we travel, then that's the distance we travel. But we finished the Paris rule book, critical to all of you, as we measure transparency and accountability and how we're going to actually function. We put in place uh, 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 a requirement that countries representing 90% of all global forests committed that they're going to end deforestation in this decade. We launched a global methane pledge, critical. Methane had been this afterthought at countless COPs. I, I, I started in COPs 1992, folks, four years after Jim Hansen first testified to us in the Congress that climate was happening. And in 1992 in Rio, we all embraced this notion, but nobody ever mentioned, not even that much in Paris, methane. Finally, methane. Methane is responsible for almost one half of the warming of the planet. And methane, as you know, released in raw methane form is 80 times more damaging than CO2. And so we have a methane pledge which now says that by 2030, we will try to reduce the Earth's methane releases by 30 percent. Well, guess what? I, th I think we can do that. I think we're going to do that. And China signed on to an agreement in the last hours of the, uh, Paris, of the Paris, of the Glasgow meeting, where they said they will release an ambitious methane plan this year, national action plan. They will join us in a work group, which we're working on now, in order, even though we have a lot of other differences, we're, we're trying to stay on track with climate. And they have agreed that uh, they will work with us to accelerate their phase down of coal. And they will also adhere to the rules and enforce their law with respect to deforestation. But if we do 30 percent reduction in methane globally in the course of the next year, that's the equivalent of every automobile in the world, every car in the world, every airplane in the world, every truck in the world, every ship in the world going to zero emissions by 2030. That's the equivalency. So that's something you all need to focus on as you think about plans and what companies you're backing or investing in and what you're doing. Because methane uh, is now being released because of the thawing of the permafrost and it just bubbles up in various parts of the world. You may have seen front page stories recently about a massive methane leak in Russia. That was discovered by satellite. So now you can run but you can't hide because satellite systems are now accounting on a daily basis. They can measure your entire supply chain, your business, your footprint, your country's footprint. And that is going to create a whole new level of accountability which will attach itself to the disclosure requirements that the SEC has begun to promulgate and that will certainly be forthcoming. So we also created in Glasgow the first movers coalition a group of daring companies that came together, big companies worth $9 trillion of assets. And they put on the line the promise that they are going to undertake to create the market, to, to create demand, to accelerate the creation of that demand. And so they have companies like uh, United Airlines, Delta Airlines, Boeing came together with Salesforce and Apple and they agreed that of all the flying that they do in their business, 5% of that is going to be with the purchase of sustainable aviation fuel at an 85% reduction in emissions level now. Now when not everybody knows how to do it, not everybody's in the market, but they're going to do that. 
Maersk, largest container shipper in the world, agreed that they are going to, in the next eight ships they build, they're going to be carbon free. Volvo said 10% of the steel that they buy in order to produce their cars is going to be green steel. It's being made now. Lafarge Holson, largest cement dealer in the world, said they're going to produce green cement now and sell it now. And you know what? They're doing it. And people are buying the green cement now, not because it's green, but because it's better cement with the absence of carbon. So this is what is going to happen, friends. I, I'm convinced of it. And I'll talk a little later, just a few moments, about technology and where we're heading. But 35 companies valued at $7 trillion sent a huge demand signal, and more are coming, we hope, in Davos uh, in a few days' time to be able to announce additional companies that are joining up with that. And we ask you, in whatever way you can, drive your companies in that direction, the ones you're working with or investing in or that you lend money to. So the truth is, though, that uh, uh, Fatih Birol of the IEA, who has been a great referee in this process and transformed the IEA, in my judgment, into a highly relevant and important entity at this point in time, not just a mouthpiece for the industry that it was originally set up to help speak for. And now the IEA says to us, if we implemented every single thing that we said we were going to do in Glasgow, we would be, by 2050, at 1.8 degrees of increase. That's what we can achieve. That's without the 35% having joined us. Think about that. The message that sent to me is, this is not dealing with the realm of impossibility. We can win this battle, but we have to do more. And that's the new reality that we have to face up to. Let me just, and, 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 and I just say to all of you that, um, that it is absolutely critical that we recognize that we can't allow energy to be weaponized in the way that President Putin has tried to weaponize it. He can't control the sun and the wind, and he can't control these new technologies that are coming online. And if any lesson I think has been learned by Europe as a result of this disgraceful, horrendous, uh, unprovoked, illegal war that is taking place, uh, the lesson is that we have to move faster to de-weaponize energy anywhere in the world. It's not the first time it's been used as a weapon. So let me just say to you that today as we meet here, and I'm very grateful, thank you Lord Mayor, and thank you to uh, City of London and to all of you who have been involved in bringing the G fans here. Um, these meetings are really critical. We've just met for two days straight with His Royal Highness uh, Prince Charles, who has convened the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Some of you may or may not have been there, but we uh, had CEOs from all around the world. And I've never seen CEOs as seized by an issue and as, as, as genuine in their commitment to leading this transformation. But here's the bottom line. As we gather in the City of London Great Finance Center, as we are bringing GFANS and SMI together, and as we are, you know, sort of extolling the virtues of where we are, we are not where we need to be. We are not moving fast enough. And for an issue that is existential, as leader after leader now appropriately calls it, we are not behaving in a way that reflects that existentiality. That's just a reality. I'm not here to say that to punish anybody, or to, but I'm just, you have to talk in terms of the science. The science is, after all, what is guiding us, not politics, not ideology. And let me remind you, please, politely, 1992 was our first COP when we got together and all signed an agreement. President George Herbert Walker Bush was there. And we all joined, Republican and Democrat alike, in a Senate delegation believing we were going to move forward, and we didn't. 35 years almost have gone by as people knew climate was happening, certainly 25, and we just haven't made the hard decisions. Coal use went up 9% in 2021. 
Emissions went up 6 percent, as did fossil fuel subsidies. $440 billion of fossil fuel subsidies. Explain that to me in context of status quo and unwillingness to move. You know the old saying, when you're digging a hole and you know you got to get out of it, the first thing you have to do is stop digging. To be having two and a half trillion dollars, we're struggling for money to affect this transition. But two and a half trillion dollars over the last four or five years has gone in to subsidizing the very problem that we have to cure. That's the definition of insanity. Moreover, we lost, what, in two years to COVID, we've lost about 15 million people globally. That's a pretty unfathomable tragedy. But let me just share with you, every single year we lose 10 million people to greenhouse gas pollution. Pollution. Greenhouse gases are pollution. And that's what motivated the environment movement of the 1970s, which I had the privilege of being part of, when we created a Clean Air Act, safe drinking water, marine mammal protection, coastal zone management, endangered species. And we created the Environmental Protection Agency of our country. That's what that movement did. And it did it all over the world. But here we are now, you know, talking, but not yet acting sufficiently. 10 million people a year die because of the quality of air around the world. 5 million people additionally die every year because of extreme heat, which is now mounting. In the Antarctic a few weeks ago, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. In the Arctic, it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. I went to the Arctic and I went to the Antarctic as secretary. And I saw this melting taking place, torrential rivers flowing down over the ice sheet of Greenland. And to the naked eye, you can just see the lines that have moved as the receding ice dominates the, the, the view. Now, I looked down a hole and saw 100 feet down there, a monumental river torrentially going out into the ocean and went to a fjord where 86 million metric tons of ice is breaking off every single day, enough water to supply greater Connecticut, New York, and, and, and New Jersey for an entire year, every day. So that's where we are. And I ask you simply to think in practical terms about the supply chains and the businesses that are out there that are so critical to the profit that you make and to the ability to be able to drive our economies, which obviously is essential. That's why President Biden is releasing some of the oil, not because he wants to be dependent on it for the next 20 years or 10 years, but because we want to stabilize the economy and try to bring prices down, deal with inflation, begin to move in a better direction so you can make these decisions that we need to make with greater confidence. Now imagine what happens, however, to your businesses. If we don't do these things, what happens to the markets? What happens to supply chains when there's an implosion in the capacity of Africa to produce its food, which is one of the threats we do face now? Every single degree of warming matters. At 1.5 degrees, stable crops like corn and rice and wheat are imperiled and supply chains will be unstable. At two degrees, corn, rice, wheat collapse, tens of millions of people could starve. We already have a problem with just Ukraine's interruption in the potential of starvation in, in Africa and elsewhere. And the ports and the roads and the rails will be regularly flooded and wash away, and you have to rebuild them. Imagine trying to conduct business in that world, folks. And it's a requirement that we do think about these things, not because John Kerry is saying it to you today or because President Biden says it uh, or Tony Blinken, but because this is the new reality if you listen to science. You can't be half pregnant on the issue of climate. If you accept the science that this blanket is warming the earth and we're making it worse every single day, that's been science that we've been hearing about for 30 years, as I said. 
Actually, you go back to 1898, and a guy named Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist who first postulated it. And there are people here and there who talked about it in between, but it really didn't gain currency until we went to Rio. But, but you know, those are the threats. But here's the good news, and there is good news. I'm an optimist about this. I honestly am. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But the IPCC, those scientists who have been guiding us, have told us in the last report just a few, what, a month or two months ago, that we still have time to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Now, let me emphasize, that's just to avoid the worst consequences, not to avoid the crisis. And that's another thing you have to put in your, your, your thoughts. In 2018, they told us we have to cut those emissions by 45% by 2030. So I ask you also to think about this. Yes, you have to do the work that was described here in the panel about planning for 2050 and coming up with a roadmap. And as, as Noel Quinn said, we need to see the roadmap. But the roadmap has to be based on reality. And the reality is that we can't get to net zero by 2050 if you don't do enough between 2020 and 2030. That has to be a major guidepost as you go along here, folks. 2020, 2030 is the first question you should be asking somebody who says we have a 2050 plan. And the fact is that, uh, that you, if you don't get the 45%, you don't keep 1.5 degrees. They're all connected. This is not a matter, as I said, of ideology. This is a matter of mathematics and physics. A lot more certainty in that than you have in many of the decisions you make about where to allocate funds. So the truth is that today, and I regret to say this, that, 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 that you know, as, as important, and, and it is important, don't, don't, don't for an instant please take me as ungrateful or unexcited about what is happening. It is a lot happening, as the panel said. There's a lot happening, folks. But there are still too many big companies, too many folks in places of big responsibility and big control of employment, of allocation of capital, of big decisions who are not yet buying in. They're sitting on the sidelines. They're kind of waiting to see. They're also loving the revenue that's coming into them from the status quo. And that is a very powerful source of of amelioration of big decisions and allowing people to sort of stall a little bit, if you will, just to rely on things as they are. Our enemy in this battle is the status quo. Our enemy in this battle are vested interests that don't want to move fast enough to change. And you can look at a couple of major fossil fuel companies that have completely embraced this change. They're moving. They're not going to be fossil fuel companies. They're going to be energy companies. And they understand that that's the future. And they're going to produce clean energy. In the United States of America, President Biden has made a commitment that the entire power sector of our nation, one of the largest producers of power in the world, is going to be carbon free by 2035. We're only going to have electric vehicles if we meet our goal by 2035. And GM and Ford have made that commitment. They're on board, as are our utilities. And GM and Ford have already spent hundreds of millions of dollars retooling their factories to be able to produce electric vehicles so that by 2035, that is all they are producing. So I, I, I ask you just to think about this. And this, this comment was made by a number of CEOs at the Sustainable Markets Initiative uh, yesterday with His Royal Highness. And that is that you know, there's a perception of risk. And I understand risk. Uh, you know, I served on the banking committee and the finance committee, and I was chairman of the small business committee, and I opened a small business once upon a time. Uh, and I learned very quickly that if I'm ever going to do that again, I'm going to move the decimal point very far to one side uh, for time and effort. But I have to tell you that, um, uh, that, that, Risk is, you have to measure it, but you can't be paralyzed by it. 
And look at the risk that venture capitalists take in a lot of places and blow it at times, even really good ones. Uh, there's just a percentage. But the truth is we have to move more capital more rapidly into the deployment of the new technologies, bringing them to scale, actually discovering them, working at that because we have to accelerate. So we have a choice. We can stay stuck in the status quo or we can transition. We can break the mold. We can secure a cleaner, safer, healthier planet. And, and everyone talking about risk needs to realize, and I believe this, you, you may not believe me, but thought about it long and hard. And every book, every analysis of this, Sir Nicholas Stern and others have written eloquently about it, it's going to cost far, far more in your taxes, in capital, in, in, in disruption, if you don't do this, if we don't move fast enough. It is far more expensive. We will spend more trillions of dollars adapting, building resilience, undoing damage if we don't move fast enough than if we invest the money and do. That is clear. So the greatest risk is not the risk of making your best judgments about where to allocate capital. The greatest risk is not moving fast enough and not doing what you know how to do. And what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong that the climate stuff isn't as bad as everybody says, but we still move fast? Well, we'll have cleaned up our cities, cleaner air, less cancer, less emphysema complications, heart disease complications, less money spent on children. We spend about 50 billion a year on it, being hospitalized because of environmentally induced asthma. We'll preserve the rainforests. Uh, we'll make the air breathable. We'll make water drinkable. We'll have cities where you can actually move around them more effectively. Just think, we'll have done all that, all for nothing. Uh, that's the downside of making the decision to do what we know we need to do. So establish, I hope, beyond doubt that moving more rapidly to this new energy economy is the best way to approach this. So how do we accelerate that transition? And let me speak to some of your very real concerns. Last year it was about raising ambition, and we got the 65%. This year we're trying to implement on everything that was promised so that the prediction of the IEA can be met, and we're trying to raise the ambition. We call it implementation plus. Bring those other countries to the table and help them to be able to do what they need to do in this, not leave them with the ability to say, oh, common but differentiated responsibility. We don't have to do this. Give us more carbon space. You guys cut further, which is physically impossible for us at this point. So this year we have to implement those promises. And what it means is we have to decarbonize uh, the power sector five times faster than we are right now. We have to deploy renewables five times faster than we are right now. Uh, we have to uh, transition to electric vehicles about 20 times faster than we are now. And we have to fully transition to a resilient net zero economy faster. So how do we create that economy very quickly? Well, in, in 2021, about 755 billion was invested globally in the energy transition. That was a record. But it's only one third of what almost every, everyone agrees is the amount of money we need to spend, somewhere between two and a half trillion and four and a half trillion every year for the next 30 years. That's what the UN finance report and other analyses tell us. Uh, so um, we've asked you very specifically what are the barriers that you see? And you've told us number one, you're not charities. Uh, you need to make a profit. We understand that. But unfortunately, there aren't enough. Uh, you've also told us that there aren't enough sustainable companies and projects to lend or to invest in. Uh, you've told us there aren't enough green financial products to buy. And, and despite great progress, policies, governmental policies, haven't yet shifted sufficiently to be able to send some of the signals that you want sent. Uh, and make it more attractive not to be doing fossil fuel. Take carbon pricing. Only one-fifth of emissions are covered by carbon pricing instruments today. 
totally inadequate. Less than 4% are covered by a carbon price in the range that's needed to meet the Paris targets. Or consider the traditional risks that, that keep people away from an investment in construction, credit, and currency. Uh, in the emergent markets, the very few places where the transition can move the fastest and the cheapest, uh, we see great restraint, and I understand that. And I think there, that's what we're trying to deal with right now, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But you've also told us that some of the key technologies are not yet fully mature, and the green premium is just too high to pay. So how do we move forward? Well, we have to begin by understanding that there's no one silver bullet and there's no one policy that's going to make this happen. Every single country is going to be different. That's what we're finding. Uh, there are four big approaches that we think matter here. One is we're focused, and these are what we're focused on. First, we need more risk-taking capital, more first-loss facilities, more guarantees, if you will, guarantees from government or other kinds, and better ways to manage currency risk. Uh, with the G7, we committed last year to provide $2 billion to the Clean Technology Fund. President Biden is working to increase the GFC money, and we've asked Congress for an additional $1.6 billion. He's made a commitment to put $12 billion a year into adaptation and resilience. Uh, in an emergency, and our, we're trying to supercharge our, our DFI, the, the Development Finance Corporation, which has a finance uh, a, a gap here, a capacity of about $30 billion. In addition, we've put $62 billion into the Energy Department, which will be very directly used to help spur the development of the new technologies, accelerate their deployment to experiment, et cetera, so we are gearing up much faster. Now, all three of these, uh, uh, these steps, we think, can help provide access to concessional funding and capital and help to de-risk uh, investments. We're working with partners, working with Jeff Bezos and the Earth Fund, with Mike Bloomberg, with uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and others. And our hope is to grow the pipeline of bankable deals much faster, working hand in hand with you in a very practical way. We also need to promote policies that are going to support the energy transition in other places. And President Biden is, con is continuing to, to push other individual initiatives when the government were working with the G7 on something called the Just Energy Transition Partnership, Jet Peas. You may hear all more about them in the course of the next weeks and months. So we're working very hands-on. We've created teams. Germany is working with us with Japan uh, and some others to focus on Indonesia. We've been meeting, we've had several team meetings. We've just got together with the Indonesians in Washington. We're pulling them to the table. Here's what they're willing to do. They're willing to close coal plants. They're willing to try to get on that 45, 50% reduction level. And they're in the 35%. And the only thing they need, the only thing, is technology and finance. And we're prepared to bring some of the big financiers to the table and see what we can do to help put together blended finance, where you have a combination of you know, first risk, first loss taker by, by um, having philanthropy particularly or concessionary, you know, big country uh, contributions, of which there are some. We're working with South Africa similarly. Uh, South Africa is being led by the UK, that effort actually, and we're working with it with Germany and others. We have eight and a half billion put on the table to help bail ESCOM out and begin to be able to move uh, to transition from the coal to the new sources uh, of energy. And, uh, you know, we're working with Vietnam. I will be meeting uh, tomorrow. We have a summit with the Southeast Asian leaders in Washington. And I'm personally spending time on Saturday at a Harvard program that uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Vietnam is going to come to. He said they're ready to transition. We really want to get specific and open up renewables. It's a country that is blessed with some gas for transition, has incredible wind, incredible sun, uh, and, uh, uh, and minimal deployment of renewable, and largely partly because they don't have the transmission line. So we're going to help try to put them in. And we'll do everything we can to accelerate. We need you to help take these kinds of things. I don't think it's that risky. 
particularly if you get them to come up with a 25, 30 year PPA with a tariff that reflects you know, the return on investment that you need here. So we need aggressive deal makers out in the marketplace, frankly. I don't see people knocking on those doors enough saying, hey, we're prepared to finance this if you'll do the following things, including conceivably some policy changes like being more uh, transparent and more accountable and you understand how you'll resolve a dispute because you have arbitration that can be done in the right place and all those kinds of ingredients of a deal that are critical. So we're helping to create customized, specific plans that will accelerate the deployment of renewables. And we also need better climate-related data. That was mentioned a little bit in the, in the panel. Uh, the SEC put out a proposal. I think that's going to help investors make wiser decisions uh, about uh, each company's climate risks and goals and targets. And it's certainly going to provide investors with more information about the reality of what lies down the road in terms of what I spoke about earlier. Finally, we're, we're building new partnerships to enable greater risk taking in new technologies. And the First Movers Coalition, which I already described, is a key, key uh, part of that. Um, so let me very respectfully implore you and, and encourage you to act in, in different ways now, new ways perhaps. The, 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 the Development Finance Corporation, at least ours, can't move if there are no applications. The First Movers Coalition and Jet Peace can only succeed if banks and investors are going to take a closer look at new markets and technologies. And the Green, Green Climate Fund can't succeed unless firms partner to develop financial mechanisms that will work. Uh, so please help take your plans. We found this in the SMI yesterday. The people are doing things, but a lot of people don't know what they're doing. Bank of America, for instance, 5,000 loan officers are now being trained to reach out. Every company they're considering lending to has to come up with a plan. They're only going to lend to people who are embracing the proper kinds of steps that we need to take as we go forward. So elevate your plans. Don't hide them. And, and be honest about the tough choices, how much risk you know, you're willing to take and exit and come out. So let me, let me just close to all of you and say this. Um, I've been at this a long time, and I remain absolutely confident the world is going to get to a low carbon, no carbon future. We're going to. It's happening. It's going to happen. No politician can turn around what's happening in the marketplace now. There's almost a trillion dollars of venture capital that's out there chasing you know, some of these new technologies. And to really learn whether I had a right to be optimistic or not, I went to California recently and I met uh, uh, in uh, Palo Alto at Stanford. I went to look at what they're doing. I looked at what Google X is doing. I checked in with our laboratory with the accelerator that is working on fusion. Uh, and I met with about 15 startups. And man, I'll tell you, I was as excited by anything I've seen uh, by those startups. Uh, I saw a battery that may well, uh, the technology is pretty much there. They're trying to figure out, bring it to scale, et cetera. 100 hours, 100 hours from battery. We have four hours today. So people are talking about how you balance your base load and how you provide security and energy. That's a game changer. Or electrolyzers, they're going to be able to produce commercial scale and move faster on green hydrogen direct air carbon capture. At Google X, I saw this carbon capture that's turning the carbon into a product, potentially a product. And there are all kinds of, in Australia recently, they did turn carbon into a product. Uh, you know, there's a new future out, folks. And, and it's going to be defined by the new energy economy. And I'm telling you, the spoils are going to go to the people who are there early and get in on those investments and make those things happen. And they're going to happen. The only issue I have the challenge I have in my confidence and optimism is I am not yet convinced that we, all of us, are acting fast enough and doing what we need to avoid the worst consequences. When I called Johan Rockström, one of the prime scientists that we listen to and who's been involved in this for years, he heads up the Potsdam Institute in Berlin, I said, what scares you the most right now as scientists in terms of the evidence? 
And he said to me, John, let me tell you, I worry that we may have passed three tipping points. I said, whoa, what are they? He said, the Arctic, the Antarctic, which I talked about, and coral reefs. Now, I can't sit here, I can't stand here and tell you, I know that's happened, he can't. But he says it's irreversible. Irreversible, what's happening there is irreversible in the near term. That's why I'm talking about worst consequences versus the crisis. So we all knew that delivering on a net zero is gonna be hard, but I ask you just to remember, uh, I was very moved and impressed as a young person when President Kennedy challenged all of us at Rice University and, and said, we're gonna put a human being on the moon by the end of the decade. He set a target, you set a target, but he made sure that we did what we needed to do to reach that target. That's what we need to do now. You are the agents of this, you have the power and you can get more people invested in this transition. And if we do that, I gotta tell you, that was 50 years after the first flight at Kitty Hawk and we got to the moon. With what's happening now with AI, and, and the pace of change in technology, we can do this, but we need you to help provide the capital. We cannot do it if we don't raise the capital necessary to affect this transition. So folks, President Kennedy said we do these things, we choose to do these things because they are hard. And what he meant by that is hard choice, hard, tough to do. But in the doing of it, you achieve great things. And I'm confident that GFANS is one of those entities in the world today that has an ability to help us achieve the most important thing we can do, which is literally protect life and species on this planet. Thank you all very, very much.